my name is uh, Frankie. I'm a senior AI scientist at Target. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick rundown of what to expect from what I'm about to talk about today. Oops, sorry, a little too far. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little overview about my background. I'm going to just give a very quick, brief time series overview, specifically uh, what I was facing at Target on my last team, on my prior team. Um, and then after that, I'll talk about how that relates to matrix profile, what it is, and then also look at how you can, well, I used matrix profile and how you can use in general matrix profile with um, a modeling approach. And then of course, Q and A, but as uh, Sophia mentioned, feel free to put questions in the chat and I'll try to get to them too throughout the presentation. Okay. So a little bit about me. Um, I did my universe, my undergrad at uh, the University of Missouri. Uh, I did my grad school uh, for a master's at the University of Minnesota. Um, I started at Target initially as a data engineer. And then I, so as a data engineer, I was working on data sciences, technologies, deep learning technology specifically. I was working on things like the, our GPU cluster, um, working with the deep learning libraries that the data scientists were using. And of course the data itself, uh, making sure everything was running smoothly. And then after that, I joined a team um, that was asking for someone with some type of machine learning data science experience um, or knowledge. And so I joined them as a senior engineer and data scientist and primarily focused on forecasting anomaly detection. That is where matrix profile time series data kind of came into play. That's where um, I, I had a lot of different tasks related to both forecasting and anomaly detection. The anomaly detection part, I think, was a little bit harder. Um, and you'll see why I think it was a little bit more difficult. And then uh, after that, I joined my current team as a senior AI scientist on the demand forecasting team. Um, we have multiple sub teams and we work on many different perspectives of how we can improve our forecasting. Um, everything from looking at similarity and um, you know, different aspects of the company, like items and stores, et cetera, uh, to looking at, you know, external factors that could impact demand and sales altogether. Um, and then a quick little plug, uh, I'm also the founder and organizer of my own meetup um, called Data Science Minneapolis. Um, I used to live in Minneapolis, and so we used to have in-person events there. Uh, we have just over 1,700 members last I checked, and Hopefully we can get back to in-person at some point. Um, we have a small group of organizers that we're still discussing how that's going to look like. So um, yeah, if anyone's in Minneapolis, feel free to reach out and um, attend any of the events, whether it's virtual or in-person. And so next, um, a little bit about like time series data and anomaly detection. So the idea with anomaly detection, especially at, at the what I was working with at the level of like enterprise anomaly detection, <clears throat> our main goal was to be able to take any time series data stream from the entire company, which is a lot, and be able to run algorithmically uh, these checks on the data streams to determine if something was going wrong or not. So something, you know, as big as something's going on with the website and target.com was down. And so um, obviously that's a big, big deal. Money's being lost there. So we had to alert the correct teams to make sure that they figure out what the issue was and then they would um, you know, figure it out and solve it as fast as possible too. So you have to worry about sensitivity of your anomaly detection, making sure you're catching everything, but also not alerting too much. And then also in a timely manner. So you want to do it as fast as possible whenever there is something going wrong. But the problem with that was the more data streams you saw, the more diverse they looked and it became very subjective. There was no source of truth because, um, and I'll show you why here with an example. So for instance, looking at something like this, this is just made up data. Uh, something like this, some people may say, okay, uh, those missing data points right there in the middle of the data stream are anomalous. Well, potentially. So there were times where I would see data that looked like this, um, a little bit noisier, a little bit messier, but there would be missing data in the middle of the night. And so with time series data, especially when dealing with something like a, a store or you know something that is um, uh, conductive like human behavior, you typically see 
peaks and spikes around the middle of the day and then it, it drops off in the middle of the night when people are going to sleep especially for a company like like target where we're solely based in the united states so you don't see as much activity at night in the united states um but i was getting to the point where this data what it would look like it at first it might look like oh if something's missing especially if you only see a couple of uh data points here um a couple of days of data however then you know you start to ask around and ask why is there missing data consistently throughout the night and it turns out that it's possible that you have something like a register a cash register system where it's actually off once a, a store closes and that means it's not returning any data or you may have some type of system in a store somewhere in in a company maybe like a, you know somewhere that is just not reporting any data all of a sudden once the store closes or once you know the end of business hours. And so it's actually not anomalous. What would actually be anomalous is if you saw data points throughout the night. And so you have to be able to catch that. And so then you start to get into like imputation, right? About how can I fill this data to make it look somewhat normal in a consistent basis and then find um, abnormalities and alert on that. Because if a store's supposed to be closed and all of a sudden you're seeing data in the middle of the night, something weird must be happening where a machine all of a sudden is online or someone is in there doing something with a machine that shouldn't be in the store physically. And so you have to be able to alert them. And then this, obviously in this case, you're not seeing that. So if there is data typically coming in in the middle of the night um, and there's missing data, then typically you're going to alert on that and then have a team go look into the issue. So, and the way we did this initially um, several years ago was it was all rules based. It was a long uh, configuration of rules that was looking at percentages and statistics. And it was it worked for certain metrics that looked like this and that were consistent and that we knew very well. However, the moment you become more of like an enterprise and you uh, enterprise level system, you scale these data streams look a lot different and will not look this clean and will look just crazy sometimes. And therefore your rules based system is going to not scale with you. It's not going to work. And so, and because of this, we start to look at other methods. Um, one that we just happened to find out and read up on and saw a presentation on was called the matrix profile. So um, quick overview of that is that it's, Based on research out of University of California, Riverside, um, I think the first paper, the first or two of them, um, were actually in partnership with the University of New Mexico um, out of Eamon Keo's lab, Dr. Eamon Keo. And basically the concept of this is it creates something called a distance profile. And um, what that looks like is this image here on the right side. So as you can see, I'll walk through this image a little bit. Um, if you can see these red lines here on the top and left, the idea here is you take a time series, some data stream, and you basically put it, you know, top and itself on the side. And what it does then is it combs through the entire series against itself and, and calculates a, a rolling dot product. So basically you're just calculating some values based on the original time series against either itself, or you could change one of these with another time series if you want to see how similar two time series uh, are. And eventually you get this giant, you know, matrix, uh, this profile. And what, we, what you do is you look at the first nearest neighbor and you pull those minimum values down to create this white stream down here on the bottom and that's called the matrix profile. So essentially what's going on here is that you're combing through a time series against another time series, it can be itself, and you're seeing how similar the chunk you're looking at is compared to the rest of it against the other one that you're comparing to. So in the case of anomaly detection, what we were looking at was we took a time series, uh, compared it to itself, combed through the whole thing um, and saw how similar the time series was compared to itself. And then if we saw instances where the time series looked very different compared to how it used to, how it normally should look like, it would get flagged as an anomaly. And so here on the bottom, you see this white 
matrix profile, but it looks like a time series as well. What this is uh, showing you is that the peaks, the top max values throughout the matrix profile, those are called discords. Um, basically, it's where uh, it's an index where the time series did not look like or it looked the least amount like the rest of itself. And so you'll see here it kind of correlates to uh, if you look at the white time series, I wish I could highlight it, but I can't and look directly up to the red time series exactly where they're taking place. You'll see that the spikes occur typically where the red lines um, look a little bit different from the previous self. Um, and then the troughs are the very bottom, the minimum values indicate where the time series looked most like what it's seen before. So the way you can think of this matrix profile uh, is that the peaks and the max values are where it looks very different. And the bottom and the minimum values look where it's, uh, it's the most similar. Um, and so based on this, we can then send time series data through here through some type of system that uses this concept to determine, you know, how similar does a time series look like to itself? Um, so they see how normal is it behaving and then how different does it look? And so based on that, we, I'm not going to, um, advertise it too much. Here we go. We ended up creating a Python library. Um, you can download it via pip or github, you can Python install it. Um, and we're able to look at and test the library and process 20 years of data here in less than 20 seconds, uh, grouped by five minute, I think it was five minute intervals. Um, so there's a lot of data and you can use a GPU because it's extremely, extremely parallel, um, depending on the method you use. There are multiple methods to calculate the matrix profile. Um, and so, oh, sorry, I see a question now. Uh, there's a question asking, what kind of anomaly are you talking about? Sales and demand anomaly or something else? So for that use case, um, it was anything and everything that could get thrown at us. So yes, we were doing anomaly detection, conducting anomaly detection on sales, not necessarily demand, but it was sales data. Um, we were not looking at demand specifically. Demand follows a, like a negative binomial and Poisson distribution. So um, my team at that time didn't have any use cases or business cases where the people in charge of like demand were coming to us. Most of the metrics that we were looking at in the data streams were related to uh, internal systems. So things like API usage or um, response responses, making sure like the 200s are coming in properly. And so you're looking at like over time. Um, and then also sales data as well for all different diff like categories, metric, like all, all, all kinds of metrics. We had thousands of them coming in. So we didn't look at each individual one. We had to basically look at like distributions and look at high level metrics. And then we'd have them in dashboards for different teams to look at their own. And it was a very self-serving system where you go in and via uh, a UI, uh, an internal website, and then you can set things up yourself and choose like sensitivity and do all this with like sliders. Um, and on the back end, this is essentially how we were doing that. We actually had the matrix profile is one method, but then depending on the type of data we were seeing from you, we would apply other different methods. So for instance, if typically your data was coming in as like a straight line or had very little noise, um, we could do basic just like outlier detection with mean and standard deviations and tell you when something was looking strange, or you could put in just an actual hard coded value as well. We'd give you the option to do that. So. Uh, we'd have essentially kind of like a basic anomaly detection method, an intermediate, and then a more complex one, depending on what your data look like. Um, next question coming in was, did you need to apply any kind of correction to take into account the effect of multiple tests? Uh, for instance, if you analyze a lot of time series, you are bound to find something. Yeah, so there was definitely a correction in place. Um, the idea was that, and I'll show an example too of how correction kind of came into play a little bit too. Um, we also had a modeling approach where the matrix profile, uh, basically this, if I can, this bottom matrix profile, we could use that as input to a model as a classification model. And I'll get into the metrics on that too and what we saw, but. <clears throat> That was one of our more complex models and we only pulled that out for um, certain data streams. And from there we could do correction. Um, and then obviously too, because it was very UI driven, 
um, we allowed the ability for the user to tell us via a UI whether something was actually anomalous or not. Um, and then also they were allowed to control the sensitivity of whatever anomaly detection method they wanted. So for instance, if they're getting alerted constantly and it was um, false positives, they could just you know, lower the sensitivity and they would, they would find it you know, at a good uh, balance for themselves. Um, because like, like I mentioned before, it, it was very subjective. There were times where two teams could be looking at the same data stream. And I remember specifically, there's one case, I can't go too deep into it, but it didn't look really anomalous, but we alerted on it. And most teams said, oh, this was not an issue for us. But there was one team that said this was like a high, a very important issue for us. And so they found it anomalous and found it very useful, but we had five or six other teams that said, we thought this was a false positive. So it, it also depends on the team and what they're looking at, what's important to them. And so you can never know for, for sure if there's a source of truth, because sometimes, you know, it's a very small issue that no one actually knows about. It's, it's, it, it gets very hairy and, and messy. Um, another question coming in is, can this be done with multivariate data as well, or for multivariate data we need to form multiple matrix profiles? So <laughs> that's actually a great, um, many people for this uh, library have asked for um, multivariate capabilities and adding multiple um, data streams in at the same time. So right now it does not work with uh, multivariate data or multiple time series. Um, that's not to say eventually maybe we can get that in there. Um, the way you would have to do it would, would be to just do a, like a one to many and then continue to do that uh, for whichever you're looking at. Um, and I'll, I'll show something interesting to you in a second. Um, maybe, oh, okay. So this is a different slide, but I'm gonna go back to the presentation just for a minute so I can also get to the modeling approach that might also clear up some questions. Um, but yeah, so here we can see there are multiple methods to calculate this thing called the matrix profile. Um, the first one that was initially introduced via the first paper was called STAMP. And it, it works <clears throat> okay. The time complexity was, it took a little bit longer. Um, it, it used a fast Fourier transform uh, to do most of its processing underneath the hood. Um, that was very quickly uh, changed and updated to use, uh, here you can see there's stomp, uh, scrimp, scrimp plus plus. Um, Basically, there, there's even more now. There, there have been more papers that have come out since even I did this implementation. Um, but basically, high level uh, stomp was a very extremely parallelizable method of conducting the matrix profile. So GPUs, uh, if you want to write code for a GPU that does matrix profile calculation, stomp was basically the way you're probably most likely going to do it. Scrimp essentially finds an approximation, so it's not doing a robust uh, method. However, it is faster. And then I think Scrimp++ plus plus is, um, that was just a iteration. So basically there are other methods that were more for streaming. So that way you didn't have to recalculate the mixer profile every single time. Um, I don't remember, I wasn't personally the one that uh, implemented any iterative or streaming approaches uh, for the matrix profile library. Um, I was more there in the beginning. So the library has expanded and we've had a lot more contributors and there's been a lot more going on. Um, so I don't know all the details about the implementations and how they've restructured the library since then, since a few years ago, but I know there are at least these uh, implementations available. And so another example of how to, oh, you can't, I, forgot to update that link on the bottom there. But another example of um, how to essentially label historical data is let's say you have you know, a time series here on the top and then you have the matrix profile on the bottom. Um, like I mentioned before, the peaks or the max values of the matrix profile uh, correspond to um, where your time series is starting to look very different compared to what it's seen before. And what you can do after this is um, a very basic way to do like anomaly detection or just label data is to set thresholds. Um, this threshold, you can do it, you know, using just basic statistics. You can set hard thresholds. So if you know your data very well and know the matrix profile values very well, um, 
something I was looking at, like the mean and standard deviation would work here as well too. And then because it is essentially a threshold, you can move it up or down. So here you could say any matrix profile value above two, we're gonna flag as just anomalous, that, that window is going to be anomalous. Um, and then you can feed that into a model or you can do whatever you want with that. Um, if you want to lower sensitivity, increase the threshold to you know, four or something a little bit more. Um, and then from there, you're basically going to label less windows or less values as anomalous. Uh, pretty basic. Um, it was pretty effective, especially depending on the data stream. Like I mentioned, we had multiple methods of doing anomaly detection. This was just one of them, but it worked for certain data streams pretty well. And so, like I mentioned before, what you can do then is, I, I like to think of the matrix profile almost as like a data uh, transformation. And so you can then feed these matrix profile values along with the time series values into you know, some type of feature set um, and then pass that into like a classification model. And so as you can see here, this is an example, you know, feature uh, looks like maybe the signal is X1, you know, your first column and then the matrix profile values corresponding to those are in the X2. And then from there, you can have other features as well if you do have some features uh, for a classification model. And then, oh, and then also another thing you can do is you look at the motifs, which if you remember, were the very similar um, windows of time series. So you can see here the first two series on top, those are the actual raw values and they look a little different um, to, to the naked eye. And, and obviously this is a case where, you know, I, I wanna make it as easy as possible to see, but obviously the data could look a little bit more different with more noise, a little bit messier. But on the bottom, you'll notice that the matrix profiles look very, very similar. And so I didn't get to, we didn't get to this far before I, I left that team, but um, we had an idea about looking at many data streams, looking at the motifs, and attempting to find out are there metrics and data streams that we just wouldn't have guessed that tend to have very similar behavior um, via this matrix profile. Uh, you know, looking at the motifs and looking at you know discords, just the pattern of the matrix profile. Can we find out you know this data stream or data streams on some area of the company? Somehow we're looking very similar to this area of this other of our company, and then can we? you know, in a manual way, at least, and to begin, figure out why they're looking the same. Maybe there is, maybe just correlation, maybe there is something going on, maybe their data, you know, is somehow getting derived from the same data stream, something, right? And so that was an idea that we had, um, and that potentially could have been useful with this approach as well. Um, and then for back to the classification, uh, I did do a quick, um, experiment with this. Um, so using different methods for classification, uh, you can see here when also including the matrix profile, um, some performance uh, out of them. So obviously you can see here that the LCM network worked well. It's a deep learning approach. Um, if for those that don't know, uh, LSTMs typically work well with like sequential learning. So um, time series usually work pretty well with um, LSTM networks for forecasting. And obviously here I, I convert it to more of a classification approach, but it still worked. Um, and yeah, so like I mentioned, it's possible to use this data transformation for, you know, an omni section in its own right, or you can then feed that into some type of model or some other system or some other method that you're attempting to produce to do whatever your use case may be um, related to time series data. So what's next? Uh, I had to take off a few bullet points here because they were already done, but a couple things and one of them led to that question uh, is release a GP implementation. There, there was a very POC GP implementation that I was able to benchmark. That's where you saw the, I think it was like 20 years of data in 17 seconds. Um, GPUs are harder and more tedious to program because it also depends on the card, the GPU card you're, you're programming for. Um, so I just never got to a point where it was even like an MVP, um, but that's something maybe we can do in the future. Uh, and then also the multi-series inputs. So 
you know, conducting a multivariate or multi-series input for matrix profiles and then being able to get some type of output from that as well. Um, what that looks like, we're not 100% sure. And then of course, uh, the contributors and the maintainers at this point, have, there are multiple libraries. So there's like an R library, there's a Golang library, there's obviously the Python library. So I know the maintainers and contributors, they are attempting to make sure that everything's pretty standardized. So that way one library doesn't have a completely different API structure and looks different and is treated different and the results are different. They want to keep them uh, pretty pretty balanced, well-balanced and similar across all libraries and languages. So it's not just, you know, one library can get it. It's more along the lines of they have to figure out how can we implement this in an algorithmic way? And then how can we translate this to make the code work for multiple languages across multiple libraries in a way that's going to look similar depending on which language you would like to use. Um, so that's part of just the open source process and contributing. Um, but yeah, I can get to questions. I think there are a couple more in the chat I'll take a look at. Um, feel free to reach out. I'm on LinkedIn, um, Twitter. Sometimes I write blog posts and put them out there too. Um, and then there's a UI, I'm not, I hope that still works, the ui.matrixprofile.org. It's just a, it was a quick user interface that lets you play around with um, how it works um, and seeing different data sets, I believe, and checking them out. Yeah. And we can post it on our Slack as well, if um, Perfect. you want to uh, try it. So I see, um, yeah, there's a couple more questions. Um, doing, uh, how do you choose the parameters? For the computation of the matrix profile. Yes, yeah, so there that is a that's a big question. Um, there is something called the pan matrix profile, which came out after the initial papers, and it was essentially um, supposed to help you uh, choose those parameters in the sense that it was essentially giving a range, and it would test out the matrix profile for all those uh, parameters. Think of it kind of like um, a grid search where it tests out these different combinations of parameters, produces like this different shading of the matrix profile. So you'll see like a big matrix profile, different shades with different, and let's say the different window sizes that you could have chosen. And then from there, you can then decide on your own which parameters and what values make sense to input as your parameters and configurations for this matrix profile. Um, as for learn parameters, it's it's for the most part parameter free. It, 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 produces just, like I said, the matrix profile values and the in indices um, to then map it back to um, the original time series. So there's not, not much you have to uh, pull from the output besides um, those, if you so choose. I see a question from Pushkal. Uh, can creating multiple profiles, having some aggregation on them, let's say mean, and then applying threshold, threshold helps in detecting anomalies. Yeah, so that's um, <laughs> starting to get into the ideas and, and everything. Um, this is, you know, the, the applications of this, I think are not super, uh, you know, hard code. Like they, when I was on that team do, conducting anomaly detection, doing this, um, a lot of these ideas were coming to us and we were testing them all. So I'd say, yes, it's, you know, possible. Um, you just have to try it on your data sets that you're looking at and looking at um, what are the use cases. So, you know, for us at that time, one of the approaches was taking the mean and looking at, you know, standard deviations above. So instead of looking, you know, there's no point looking below because you're looking at similarity at that point. So any values above a certain, you know, threshold. And that helped us with anomaly detection and it worked relatively well. Um, from there, you just have to make sure if you care about one point, you have to clear it's and then you have to worry about streaming data too. So we are recalculating the matrix profile every single time there's a new data point coming in, which can get costly. It honestly worked really fast where it only take, it would take milliseconds to run. So it wasn't a big cost to us, um, but we would also limit the amount of data that we were running it on. So there are obviously uh, costs and benefits to any approach, but um, yes, you can, come up with even more ideas to be able to apply this. And um, I'm sure Dr. Imanke would even be happy to see if anyone ends up with a very solid concrete application. Mm -hmm. I see a question from Eric. By, hi, Eric. Eric is, uh, you know, like our core member, <laughs> our supporter. Uh, so he's asking, can this be used for predictions? 
Or predictions. So I, I don't think it necessarily, it's more of, like I said, um, a data transformation. So in the sense that it can be used for prediction, I, I could see you being able to use it to feed into a, a forecasting model. Um, I have never tried that, but I, I don't see why I, it could be just in a predictor. I mean, you'd have to look at the analysis of, you know, the coefficients, depending how you want to do the forecasting model, like how could that help improve your model? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, potentially, yes. I, I have no idea if that works or not, but it could be just another perspective for your model to learn more about your data and looking at um, patterns in the data, depending on the uh, indices. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank, I'm, I'm wondering, um, so you mentioned that uh, you used 20 years of data. What kind of data it is, like, where did you, what kind of data did you use? Where did you find it? Uh, yes, let me try to remember. That was, um, where was that? yeah, um, honestly, I don't remember. This was several years ago. Um, I remember there is, there is an open source project that was attempting to also do a GPU implementation of matrix profile, um, specifically for certain types of GPUs. And I remember they had an open data set that had 20 years of data. Um, so I was able to take that, build upon the GPU implementation for specifically my needs in this NVIDIA K80. And it was within target. So I was building, I was restructuring and rewriting the code a little bit to work for our GPU. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I think I was aggregating the data a little bit different. Um, but I remember that I think the data file came from them. I think it was just a text.txt .text file with uh, each row being like a data point. And it, it ran in about 17 seconds. I remember that, but I, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly what the data was on. I just remember it was time series data with a lot of it, and it was used as a benchmark for another implementation that I want to use for my implementation to check um, the apples to apples comparison. So I, I noticed that you guys used uh, LSTMs, like you, you trained on different uh, uh, models. Is there any like sort of plans to try uh, tra transformer based models to see how that will perform? Um, not well, maybe if I was on the team still, <laughs> uh, that team, uh, essentially what, it, what it's at now is it's more like in the ma maintain mode, maintenance mode where um, the system's there, the enterprise system's there, it does what it's supposed to do, it does forecasting and all detection relatively well. So um, I, I'm not sure if they're looking at any new features or new model architectures because um, that forecasting and also the knowledge actually they have right now is pretty is pretty robust and, and works for many different various type of streams of data. Um, ideally, you know, if I was there, I would, I would hopefully be able to get the opportunity to test out many different networks to do for a um, either an or forecasting, but yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I wish I had um, been there for that and been able to work on maybe using transformer models in some type of way. So I see another question in our chat. Did you try metrics profile with hierarchical sales data? Mm. No, I did not try it on hierarchical sales data. Um, that's a good point. I don't know for sure, do not quote me on this, but there may be a method to for hierarchical data. I would have to double check that, but there are, I mean, there's about 12 papers out there related to the matrix profile. And I, I only remember the first couple. And then after that, um, I, I couldn't keep up with them. Um, but I can take a look, um, feel free to message me if you're interested in that. I can take a look to see if there's uh, any implementation that can take a look at hierarchical data as well. 